I'm Connie Mead. When we think about cancer and our fears of it, we typically think about the more common cancers, breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, prostate cancer. But among the lesser known cancers is one that uh, responds well to early detection, and that is head and neck cancer. But this cancer also presents its own unique uh, characteristics and challenges in that it requires not only cancer treatment and follow-up, but sometimes rehabilitation as well. So today we turn our attention to head and neck cancer and we learn what we can do to prevent its occurrence. Uh, joining me for our discussion today, I have two guests that I'd like to welcome. The first is uh, Dr. Arthur Loritano, who is a Chelmsford physician with Mass ENT on Meeting House Lane, Meeting House Road. And also we have, again, uh, joining us today is Meg Lemire Berthel, who is from the Cancer Center at Lowell General Hospital. Meg is the Director of Oncology Social Work and Outreach over at the Cancer Center there. So Thank I want to you. welcome you both to the program. Thank you. I thank you for coming in. You know, we've been in the middle of snow here, so I appreciate your trekking through all that to get here. Um, let's just start for a minute and talk about um, what an ENT is. Uh, you're a physician and your specialty is known as... ENT, so yes. why don't you tell us what that encompasses? Well, I'm an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. It is a surgical specialty. Uh, the other name for it is otolaryngology, but that's often too long for people to remember, so most mm -hmm. people call us ENTs. And our field, we deal with both children and adults. Mm -hmm. We still do a lot of tubes for ear infections. Tonsils and adenoids are still a very common surgery. We do nasal surgery, including straightening out deviated septum so that people can breathe more easily. We do sinus surgery to help with sinus problems. We do some ear surgery, uh, either for ear infections or for difficulty with hearing. And then we do a lot of what we call head and neck surgery, and that encompasses cancer surgery, also taking out benign growths in the head and neck. We do a lot of thyroid surgeries, which some ENTs do, sometimes general surgeons do that. Our practice is a bit unique where we do many of the thyroids in this particular area. ENT is also an interesting field because we do a lot of non-surgical Things. So we see patients for allergies, although in Chelmsford we have really good allergists, so we tend to refer patients to them. Mm -hmm. We see patients for hearing loss that is not amenable to surgery, and that's actually the more cu t common type of hearing loss, sensory neural loss, where people need hearing aids. We see patients for just congested noses, sore throats, tonsillitis that may not respond to their initial treatment by a primary care doctor. Not necessarily to the point where they need tonsillectomy, but just to treat those type of infections. We also get called in for various type of airway emergencies or for mm -hmm. bad nosebleeds. Uh, this morning I was at one of the hospitals for someone whose airway was beginning to close off from an allergic reaction to a blood pressure medication. Mm -hmm. So those are the type of things that we deal with. We do tracheotomies for people with airway obstruction or patients who have been sick in the ICU for a long time and are on a ventilator. So it encompasses basically everything just below the brain and just above the chest. Okay. And that's what we do. And we don't do any spine surgery on the back of the neck. That's more neurosurgery and orthopedics, so we keep things sort of to the front part of the neck and the head area. Okay, but it does sound like a lot. There's a lot that it's can go wrong there that Absolutely. you don't realize. And we don't do eye surgery. Many okay. years ago it used to be eye, ear, nose, and throat. All right. Uh, eye surgery has its own set of specialties and subspecialties, so we work near the eye but not in it. Okay. Well, today we're going to focus on head and neck surgery. So this is uh, head and neck cancer, I'm sorry. Um, but, so this must be something that presents itself from time to time in your practice, yes. I would think. So, and um, it's something we have to think about. Uh, the patient who comes into my office who says, I have a sore throat that's lasted a little longer than my usual sore throats, and I see that they're a one-pack or two-pack-per-day smoker, mm -hmm. I'm immediately thinking this sore throat might actually be the early symptoms of a cancer. It may not just be a strep throat. Now, fortunately, most times it turns out just to be a strep throat okay. or a viral infection, but the onus is on us to make sure it's not something more severe. And if it is, that we catch it early and treat it, and we'll talk about that today. Okay, so when we say head and neck cancers, what cancers are these? I mean, is it just anything that 
it happens in that area you were just yes, talking about? Uh, most specifically, when we talk about head and neck cancer, we do see skin cancers in the head and neck area. A lot of the dermatologists and plastic surgeons, as well as us, take care of that. We do see thyroid cancer, but really what we're talking about today is the group of cancers that we often link to smoking, although there are some other causes as well. So we're talking about cancer of the tongue, the floor of mouth area, which is just below the tongue mm -hmm. where the dentist puts the suction when they're working on your teeth, mm -hmm. uh, the tonsil area, the palate, which is the roof of the mouth, the hard palate, or the soft palate, which includes the uvula, the little dangly thing in the back of your throat, the voice box, um, the vocal cords themselves, or the area around the voice box, the beginning of the swallowing passage just above the esophagus, and sometimes even the upper esophagus as well. Uh, also, cancers in the neck. Occasionally, a patient shows up with a big mass in the neck that's a cancer that has spread from elsewhere in the head and neck area, and we have to try to find what's called the primary site where it came from. Sometimes we don't find the primary. It's just cancer that's spread to the neck. We see some cancers inside the nose. We see some sinus cancers. Uh, we see cancers in the parotid glands, which are the saliva glands, or in the submandibular glands here. So there's a lot of other types of cancers that we can see in the head and neck area besides smoking-related ones. For instance, the saliva gland ones um, tend not to be related to smoking. Certainly the thyroid ones are not. But the majority of the ones that we see excluding thyroid are cancer of the voice box, the tongue, the tonsils, all those areas that encompass a lot of our swallowing and speaking areas and breathing areas. Okay. So now what causes these? Do you know, Meg? Or do you have any? Well, it could be a virus. Okay. It could be a carcinogen. Um, basically, the head and neck cancers account for about 3 to 5 percent of all the cancers. Mm -hmm. We see it more in people over the age of 50, more so in men, but over the last about eight years, we've seen a new trend to the younger generation, and that may be directly related to the HPV virus, which I'm going to ask Dr. Laurentano to talk about after, because you're seeing that in the younger population. Okay, so it's not now, it's not restricted to people over, no, you said, a certain anymore. age or anything. So it's no, a wide age, it more is. often in men, you say. Yeah. Um, and are there any risk factors associated with this? I the, mean, why don't you take it? Okay. From yeah. Smoking is the biggest yeah. one. Okay, smoking. When you look statistically at head and neck cancers, and, and again, I'm going to exclude the salivary gland and the thyroid and the skin cancer, skin cancer being mostly from sun exposure. But when we look at the voice box cancers, tonsil cancers, all of those type of things, 85% of them are linked to smoking or to tobacco use. Yeah, okay. uh, we do see, so for smoking, for instance, we're thinking about tonsil cancers, cancers in the back of the throat, and definitely the voice box, the laryngeal cancers, also the upper esophageal cancers. We think a lot about smoking. Smokeless tobacco uh, can cause cancer on the tongue, cancer in the floor of mouth area, cancer around, around the gum line itself. Cigar smoking and pipe smoking can be linked to cancers of the lips, uh, particularly I, I had an uncle who used to let his cigar dangle from his mouth. He wouldn't right. smoke it, but he'd leave it there for hours. Those lead to cancers on the lips themselves. We also see tongue cancers from smoking as well. So 85% are linked to smoking. We think that smoking can actually cause head and neck cancer. It's hard to say what the mechanism is, but right. statistically that makes sense. Alcohol is considered a promoter, meaning that if you smoke, you have about a 15 to 20 percent chance of having head and neck cancer as compared to the non-smoking population. If you drink alcohol excessively and smoke, that goes up another 20 times. So we don't see alcohol as a sole cause. If someone just drinks alcohol and doesn't smoke, we don't see them as being at a higher risk for head and neck cancer. There are other cancers we worry about with that. Right. But if they smoke and drink together, we see the alcohol is promoting the carcinogenic effect of smoking. Um, the 15 percent that are not in the smoking group our patients, many of them have a viral cause, human papillomavirus, or HPV. Now, this is the same virus that causes cervical cancer in women. Mm -hmm. And many of the cancers, even the ones that are related to smoking, we can culture those, or we can test those for viral load, and we'll actually find that HPV exists in often about 50% of those cancers. And we see it a lot in tonsil cancers, for instance. We see it in some of the laryngeal cancers. And this is interesting for a few reasons. First of all, with many of these cancers, if the person tests positive for the virus, even if they're a smoker, if they stop smoking, we actually find those, those cancers tend to respond better to treatment if they're positive for HPV. The other aspect of it is that we find that patients who don't smoke, we now have an explanation for why many of those, many of those patients develop these cancers. It's because they test positive for HPV, and HPV is spread through sexual contact. We're now doing vaccinations in young kids okay. before they're sexually active to try to prevent the spread of cervical cancer. It started as a, vaccina a vaccination for young women. We're now looking at giving it to young men 
because it's felt that they spread the virus to their partners and that's what causes the cancer. But we may potentially see a benefit as head and neck surgeons in that we may see a marked reduction in head and neck cancer in this younger population who tends to get it from human papillomavirus. Okay, well, you've covered a lot of ground there. Um, but let me just back up a couple, sure. of, uh, a little bit there. Now, in terms of this HPV vaccine, it's now not given to young men. Is that correct? As far as I know, it's not. I know the pediatricians are starting to recommend it. Um, Can someone... Being that I'm not a pediatrician, right. I don't know the exact uh, nature of how they're going about doing that. But I, I know the, the brand name, I believe, is Gardasil. Okay. I know that's the main right. one that people are using. And I know that, um, you know, I know they're certainly giving it to women, I think, before age 13 or before they're sexually right. active. But I know there's talk about giving it to young boys as well. I okay. don't know where that's going. Yes, some research now, on it. I think it's yeah. mainly research right. at this point. So could somebody, could a young man, let's say, go into their pediatrician's office or their um, primary care physician's office and request it? At least yes. to discuss it. At least to discuss Absolutely. it. Okay, okay. So it's, mm -hmm. it's possible they could receive it if mm -hmm. they felt that they were at risk yes. mm -hmm. for this virus. Okay. Yes. Um, and once you have the virus, there's nothing you could do to get rid, get of, rid it. of it. Okay, okay. So you just you can't just give them a little no. um, antiviral no. medication that's no. going to get rid of it. Okay, no. okay. So, but then it turns into a cancer. Is it like can, yes. Okay. The other thing I wanted to ask you talked about smoking and smokeless tobacco as being uh, primary causes of this as well. Is there, not to say, I know smoking isn't good for you and tobacco is not good. Is there like a, a threshold that one crosses at a certain point? Or not, or it's just oh, it's not just, that we know of. And I mean, okay. the, the party line is tobacco use is bad. For yeah. You. Okay. So you try to get people uh, to. We really try to get yeah. people to stop completely. You okay. Know, or not start. Or not start. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. That's the bigger trick right. because years ago I used to hear that you had to smoke a few years before you were considered a smoker, even if you quit. Now the theory is, if you have smoked more than six months, you are at some of the same risks that a smoker is. Right. So the trick is not to let the new kids start or the new adults start. Right, okay. All right, so no smoking is no good. Smoking. And, right. and, and then, no tobacco use. I give yeah. a lecture at uh, one of the local high schools about head and neck cancer and tobacco use, and it's, it's fairly graphic. The teachers have asked me to show mm. the pictures of the cancers and the surgeries that I do. But we also focused on smokeless tobacco because mm -hmm. in the high school, mm. it's thought that a lot of the kids say, right. oh, yeah, smoking is bad for you but they'll chew tobacco, right. and they right. think that doesn't carry the same risks. Yeah. And I always get the question, what about smoking pot? You know, there's oh, always right. one yeah. or two kids will ask me about that, and it, there's not good data on it. We still think it has carcinogens in it that will mm -hmm. still affect and, and cause the same type of cancers. It's just there's not as many pot smokers, and people don't smoke as much as they do in terms of cigarettes, right. where it's one to two packs per day, but we right. still think there's risk. And I have patients who smoke exclusively mm -hmm. marijuana and have had cancers from that. Yeah. So I we see. definitely okay. do see it. So there is really no safe tobacco okay. use. And then you're also saying that if you combine it with alcohol, that's like a deadly it mix. much worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. okay. All right, okay, so that's good. So by avoiding those things, so it's like a lifestyle thing is mm -hmm. really yes. what you're saying, that these are cancers brought on by lifestyle, it right. sounds like. Yeah. This is a preventable cancer, Okay. really, when you think about it. The number of patients who get it from smoking, that's preventable. If you consider the vaccination for HPV and you do that and we pre can prevent all of those cancers, a lot of these cancers would not happen. But okay. there's just a huge number of people who are still smoking and using tobacco products. Okay. All right. And so when they come to you, what are the symptoms? Is it, uh, you know, they just have a sore throat or it could be any, is there like anything throat, you can see? Yes. Or? So okay. in terms of symptoms, we encourage patients, particularly if they're smokers, to come in if they have had a sore throat that's lasted for more than a couple of weeks or just seems to be out of the ordinary from their typical sore throat. If there's been a change in voice, if someone is a smoker and they've had hoarseness for more than a couple of weeks, we'd rather them come in our office so we can take a look at the voice box. We can do that very easily. We have a small flexible telescope we pass through the nose after putting some anesthesia in the nose. So the patient's awake. We look right at the vocal cords. We can diagnose these cancers very early. Pain with speech, pain with swallowing, um, a, uh, a difficulty swallowing where they feel that things are getting stuck in the throat because there may actually be a mass there. Sometimes just a sense of a lump in the throat. Or one of the common ones is a sore that's not healing. So, you know, if you get your typical canker sore, mm -hmm. sometimes they can last as long as a couple of weeks. But if you have something on your tongue, for instance, that starts out looking like a canker sore, but now two, three weeks later, it's not getting better. In fact, it's getting a little bit bigger. It's getting more painful. That needs to be evaluated for a cancer, similar to other sores or ulcers in the mouth. We need to look at that. There are white patches that can develop on the tongue. The technical term for that is leukoplakia, which is Greek for a white patch. So it's really okay. just, a, just a descriptive term. About 5% of those persistent white areas can actually be a cancer. 
Sometimes there's a very red, angry-looking area on the tongue that has persisted. Those have about a 20% chance of being a cancer. Those are called erythroplasia, which just means a red patch.